Oi, oi, it's your boy, the original fighting nerd, Jack Slack. It's the Jack Slack podcast, and we're coming at you following a low key weekend of fights at the Apex. Not terrible. Some good stuff, some stuff to talk about. I didn't do anything in the lead up to this because it, this is it. There's going to be cards now that just they don't sell anything beforehand. Um, but the fights could still turn out all right. But then at that point, why are you not just watching every random PFL or Invicta or whatever? But I was interested in seeing how my boy Kaya Baralio did against Jared Cannonier, And I watched the rest of the fights just because, and they turned out all right. I did see that, well, I mean, you'll, you'll have noticed that there's a large drop off in uh, not just like MMA YouTubers covering this stuff, but the sites themselves, the MMA fighting in places like that. Just People just don't cover these fights anymore, these, these UFC events, which is crazy. And I didn't last week because I thought, you know, why punish myself? when I could be writing about the Craig Jones Invitational and the effect of the pit on the grappling, which I thought was a good use of my time, and I did. So, yeah, if you're on the Patreon, go read that. But why bury the lead? We're not going to go long today, so let's jump in with Kaya Baralio versus Jared Cannonier. Cannonier coming off the um, loss to Imovov, which he was competitive in, but not winning, and then he got stopped, and people weren't happy about how early the stoppage was. And I saw someone say this, and I thought it was an interesting point. Someone said, the worst thing that could ever happen to you health-wise as a fighter is to suffer a, a, a very high-profile early stoppage because the next time the ref's going to let you die in there. <laughs> Which um, Dan Mergliata did almost let Jared Cannonier die. Got dropped in the fifth round. The kind of, of punch where in boxing they wouldn't even bother counting because he went stiff and he just fell flat. And then Kaya Borrelio jumped on top of him and started hitting him. Hit him a few times clean, and that seemed to wake Jared Cannonier up. It was another one of those like Brock Lesnar, Shane Carwin ones, where you got the sense that, well, I don't know, maybe the UFC did say something to the ref, but I'm not going to accuse anyone. But Brock Lesnar gets dropped by Shane Carwin, pounded on relentlessly for about a minute, but Shane Carwin gets really tired doing it, and Brock Lesnar comes back from the dead. There's a lot of fights that might actually turn out like that if you just let the, the guy on top keep hitting far beyond a justifiable stoppage. Because the moment you drop someone, it's basically theatre. You need to like make it look like you're going to kill the person. But this fight, I enjoyed it enormously. I thought um, Kaya Baraglio, I've had my eye on him for a while since his second Contender Series fight. Was the first time I think I saw him, because he had two fights in the Contender Series. They said, you weren't interesting enough, come back again. Just quick tangent on how stupid the Contender Series is getting. They had some lad on there for his second win on the Contender Series. Uh, they didn't like how he got it done. And Dana made a big deal of being like, uh, you wouldn't hang in the UFC, uh, go away and get three or four more fights and then talk to us about coming to the UFC. It's like he won both his fights on the Contender Series, this dude. So they're just doing it to like add some drama because people lose on the Contender Series and get stopped and the UFC invites them to step in at short notice. This dude, maybe he won't because they specifically don't want to do that for him now. But if it were any other dude who lost on the Contender Series or won on the Contender Series but didn't get a contract, they'd just give them a short notice fight when someone pulls out later. But this dude, because he was part of that viral clip, now is just never getting into the UFC. <laughs> um, but Kaya Baralio, yeah, he was another one who did two on the Contender Series. I saw his second one. That was when I was trying to watch all the Contender Series. I thought, oh, better get in on this. And I had a couple of really good weeks because I had, I think it was Jailton Almeida, Jack Della Maddalena, and Kaya Baralio. Two of those guys were on the same week. But like, for a couple of weeks, it was really, really good. And then it went back to being what it normally is, which is just, you know, regional MMA. Though it was nominated in the uh, MMA Awards, the uh, Fighters Only MMA Awards, it was nominated under the category of best programming, like a podcast or a you know Ariel Hawani show, because it's certainly not best promotion, and it is a fight promotion. So they just like, how can we get an award on this fucker? It's not bad MMA; it's good MMA programming. And if you're not watching it for the fights, like what are you watching it for, Johnny, to tell you something about fights that makes no sense and then lose his 18th bet on the trot? But anyway, Kaya Baralio's second fight on the Contender Series was pretty good, and I got a lot of Machida vibes off him. Fight Southpaw stays at very long range, tried to get the guy to run in on him. He, he basically was like sidekicking the knee with his lead leg and circling out, and then the guy ran in and he hit him with a left hand, uh, you know, a counter left straight down the centre, an intercepting punch. And it was very minimalist. He didn't do a lot of striking on the feet, but he kept... Well, that was Machida's thing. Like, if you go watch Leo Machida's fights, you'll be astonished at how little happens. But when something does happen, 
He crashes into the opponent. He knocks him over. Big moment. And then the rest of the round, you know, if they survive the round, not a lot else happens. If they don't, he gets the stoppage. And there was a lot of that in Baraglio. And then, um, you know, when he came to the UFC, I got to see a lot more of his grappling. I really liked his fight with um, Magman Muradov, who I, I quite enjoyed as a fighter. But he had a few decisions when he came in. So people weren't super sold on him. They thought he was quite a boring fighter. But that Muradov fight, he hits a beautiful giggler sweep and a load of other cool stuff on the ground. Um, and then if you were following ADCC back in 2022, the um, Melky Galvao's team, which is like Mika Galvao, uh, they had Diego Hayes at the time. They had a couple of other really good guys and Damien Meyer also. They all went to train with the fighting nerds and they said like, this is a really good MMA gym grappling wise. So we're training here. So yeah, that, that got me interested in the fighting nerds more largely as well. And I think they are, are they on an undefeated run in the UFC at the moment? They're certainly on a very good run in the UFC at the moment. So, uh, and they just come out of nowhere. They're just around a team in Sao Paulo. Um, and that's the wonderful thing about this sport. I say it like, I say it all the time, but like a team of random Dagestani dudes worked out how to be the best at this sport. A random team of Senegalese people could work out the next step in the evolution of this sport. I mean, Senegalese do not seem tremendously interested in MMA at the moment, but it could come out of anywhere. And that's really what is so exciting about fighting. Every culture on earth has some history of combat sports and normally some kind of folk wrestling style. But anyway, against Jared Cannonier, what I really liked was Baraglio's lead hand, or Baraglio, however we're saying it, fought Southpaw for most of the fight. So his jab was his right hand. Cannonier switched between stances, but for a lot of the fight was um, Southpaw after he ate a couple of good calf kicks from Orthodox in the opening round. What this fight was, was a an education in uh, how the lead hand can be used defensively. And when you say that, you know, you think of a traditional martial arts class where they throw you their jab and you use your lead hand open to come across and slap it from the inside, which is about the worst way to parry a jab that you can do unless you're immediately throwing your right hand back. What you can do with your lead hand offens uh, defensively is to put it out straight ahead of you, which seems like day one beginner, don't do that stuff. But there's actually three positions where it's really useful. One is if you, you know, the, the classic long guard, in all of these, you keep your rear hand high, put your lead hand open in their face, and that'll do a good amount to stop them from hitting, well, not stop them from hitting you, but make it harder for them to hit you because they're punching around your arm and shoulder. They can't see what they're doing. Uh, if, they're, if they're running really far in, you can push on their face. If you watched uh, the last round of this fight, Jared Kennedy goes down, um, not the time he was knocked down, he goes down earlier than that. And the commentators are like, what knocked him down? Did he slip? What happened? And it was because he was, pressing in and Baraglio pushed his face, just pushed him back by the face and he was off balance. And I think the mat was pretty slippy for this fight because they were both sliding all over the place at various points, both wiping their feet off. Bisping thought that um, Baraglio was hurt in the first round, but he was actually just wiping his feet off instead of doing the chicken dance. But it's the apex mat. So unless they change something, I don't know what it would be. Maybe they changed the sponsor. Sponsor logos, people are always slipping on. But the other positions your lead hand can go to is open palm uh, on the lead shoulder, their lead shoulder, and open palm on the rear shoulder or over their rear shoulder. So on the lead shoulder is like you bring your hand across and you put the pinky side of your wrist, like your karate chopping them in the neck, you put that on the side of their neck and you can push away from them, you can frame on them. Uh, if they start loading up their left hand, you can push that shoulder back and uh, you, can, you can stay down behind your lead shoulder too. So you're in a nice shoulder rolling position, you've got your, your rear hand high. It's a, it's a really nice base to start countering from, and you can feel what they're doing with your hand. You get that nice um, sensor out ahead of you. And the other one is to throw your lead hand over their rear shoulder, which blocks their rear hand a lot of the time. If, if um, We talk about this a lot, but like the worst place to block something is close to the target. So if you're throwing an overhand at me and I raise my left hand up high, like I'm answering the phone, you know, I put my elbow up and I take the punch on the, uh, on the um, meat of my arm, and it smashes into my head. That's not the best because it's going to move me around. It's going to shake my stance. It's going to maybe rattle my head a bit. If you get a good head kick on the arm or something like that, that can still daze you. But if you block out right where the, the attack is starting, so put your hand over the guy's bicep as he's trying to throw an overhand at you. That's called a leverage guard. That's what this is. And it makes it very hard for him to hit you. As long as you push out into the path of their bicep, uh, if you just leave it out there, they'll just throw across the top. So Baraglio was doing loads of that. He was uh, backing up with his rear hand high, so his left hand high because he's southpaw, and his 
lead hand on Cannoneer's lead shoulder, on his far shoulder, over his far shoulder, or just in his face. And the downside is that in these gloves, people get poked in the eyes. And Bahalio came out and immediately poked Jared Cannoneer in the eyes, which really soured my view of the fight generally, because then he kept putting his hand in uh, Cannoneer's face, and you're like, well, he is now worried about getting poked in the eyes. But generally, all the technical work with his lead hand was great. Lovely long guard, leverage guard, whatever you want to call it. It, Different sports, it has different names, but using his lead hand really well to cut off uh, Cannoneer's offensive options. He was really good at getting down behind his shoulder, really good blocking with his rear hand. You saw Cannoneer was having good success with the right hook a lot of the time, stepping through uh, Southpaw and throwing the right hook. But a lot of the time he was just hitting the the meat of the of the lower end of the forearm, like down by the elbow. Bahalio was raising up really high. Really good to see. I thought he was doing a great job defensively. He was doing some nice shoulder rolls. And then in the later rounds, he was using the shoulder roll to throw back, which is what you want to see. The, sh- the shoulder roll is so brilliant because one, it works in small gloves because you're putting your, your chin down behind a big bone and you're trying to turn with the punch so that if it hits you in the temple or whatever, it's still gliding off. But the moment you feel someone's right hand or power hand thud off your shoulder, you know they're exactly close enough that you can hit them on the chin with your power hand. Unless they're like a foot taller and a foot longer in the arms than you. So the shoulder roll has always been a beautiful platform for counter offense. That's the phrase I always use. Uh, And in the last round, before the knockdown, before he turns his lights out momentarily, um, just before that, there's an exchange where uh, Cannonier comes forward, throws some punches. Baraglio takes them on the shoulder, shoulder rolls and pivots, and then throws his left hand back. And it's not a pretty left hand. It's like bowed out sort of hooky thing. But it hits Cannonier. And it seems to stun him a bit. Cannonier backs up and then the punches that come in after that drop him. So it could be the case of that being the start of the end. Well, it wasn't the end because the fight didn't end. But uh, the start of that bad sequence for him was him getting stunned off a shoulder roll. Really like that. Bahalio, he went southpaw. So he fought southpaw for the mo- for most of the fight. He went orthodox occasionally. And what, when he did, he used the correct techniques for the matchup. The style, ma- sorry, the um, stance matchup. And he really made them count. So he goes orthodox in the first round momentarily. And he throws a really hard calf kick and lands clean. And Cannonier goes, ow, and has to switch to southpaw. And then he's in southpaw for most of the fight. I thought what was missing from Cannonier was was the leg kicks, uh, particularly from orthodox, a step up outside low kick. So his lead leg into the into the outside of Brujalio's lead leg, which he'd used really well against Anderson Silva back in the day. In fact, he TKO'd Anderson Silva with that, but people were still pretending that like when Anderson Silva loses by TKO, it's an injury and you have to like call it a doctor's stoppage, like McGregor shouting at the doctor's stoppage, not a TKO. Um, but no, it was a TKO. But I would have loved to see Cannonier focus on that more. If you want to see someone do that really well, we talk about the T-step a lot with the inside low kick, step up inside low kick. This is against the southpaw, so it's a step up outside low kick, but it's the same technique, basically. You step up with your rear foot, you kick with your lead foot, and then you can step back into southpaw. You can put your lead foot down and step back with your rear foot again. You can step down into the overhand or the right straight, as Dan Henderson used to do. But Jerome Labana is a great example of someone who did that from an open stance matchup like this one. So Cannonier was orthodox for the first round. Bahalio was southpaw for the whole fight. Labana was southpaw, but he fought a lot of orthodox fighters. And what he'd do was step up outside low kick with his right leg over and over again. And he was right-handed and right-legged, so it was a really powerful kick. And then when they started picking that leg up or trying to slide back or whatever, or trying to counter, he'd step up as if to low kick. And then he'd drive forward with a big overhand instead. He wouldn't pick up his lead leg to kick. He'd just put it forward and throw the overhand. He knocked out Francisco Filio like that, uh, put him through the ropes, which was very impressive. I think that was Filio that he put through the ropes. But he had a couple like that where he just ran into the overhand, basically. And because you've got this preliminary motion, you've got a telegraph built into your step up inside low kick or step up outside low kick. Whenever you do a step up kick with the lead leg, there's a telegraph because they see your rear foot moving. But if you bring your rear foot up underneath you, you can lunge way further with your punches than you could before. So if you're trying to punch the guy, he's going to notice that and he'll be like, no, I'm not letting you do that. But if you set it up with that step up kick over and over again, or just a couple of times, and you get them on one leg or whatever, you can just go, you can run through them like a train. So I would have liked to see that. Um, he did land a couple of good outside low kicks on, on Boralio. Um Boralio basically dealt with the low kicks by switching stance and low kicking back and also just sort of dropping away from the low kicks. So it would have been a case of uh, Cannonier having to pressure him towards the fence, but Cannonier was not doing very well going forward, particularly because of Bahalio's jab, 
and uh, the, the long guard work that he was doing. Borale was also doing really nice work with a left knee, which is something that he also used on the Contender Series back in that f- first fight I saw him in. But the intercepting left knee, that was all... That's so Machida vibes. It's a very Machida-coded move. <laughs> but Machida would get you following around the ring, and then you'd take a step, and he'd step and meet you with his left knee, hit you in the gut, and then he'd shove you away as hard as he could. And Borale landed a couple of those. He got caught on one leg quite a lot. Um, this fight definitely confirmed to me that he's got a very good chin. Because he wasn't getting away scot free. He wasn't technically perfect. You know, he wasn't um, untouchable. He wasn't Floyd Mayweather versus Juan Manuel Marquez. He was still in a fist fight and getting hit, and he took it very, very well. And if you watch his jab, I loved his jab. I loved how frequently he used his jab. I loved how he's landing his left straight off his jab. I love how his jab mixed into his um, defensive work by him using that long guard. I did not like the way that when he threw his jab, his chin came up and he whipped his head back to look at the ceiling almost every time. But no grappling in this match at all, but just a pure striking fest. Really fun. Um, Cannon, I still love his like little shifts into Southpaw. He did a lot of work from Southpaw in this fight because he got hurt with the low kicks early on. Uh, I do prefer him to work from Orthodox and then throw the Southpaw in. But he still does that thing where he starts from Orthodox. He steps as if he's going to shift through and punch you. And you step back. And he goes, oh, didn't get there in time. And he just lingers a second. And the guy comes back in and he pops them with a southpaw jab from his new stance. He did it against uh, Gastelum. He did it in this one. Uh, I think he did it against Imovov as well. Like, it's a really cool move. You shift as if you're like about to run the guy down. And then you go, oh, no, he's got away now. And you look visibly deflated. And then they just come back in and you pop them. But there should have been a TKO for that fifth round. Uh, Cannonier's corner should have stopped it, to be honest. But this is the, this is the discourse we constantly rehash in uh, MMA because corners will not stop the fight. Because if you stop the fight, everyone loses half of their pay, which is, you know, just brutal. And that's set up so that we have brutal stoppages and so on. But it does, uh, you know, there are there are occasions where you're like, this is just not necessary. This is silly. Other stuff on this card. I think the one that's stealing a lot of the air in the room is uh, Wang Kong. Nickname should be King. I believe it's Wang Kong as opposed to Kong Wang. She's listed as Kong Wang on a lot of sites, but I believe family name is Wang. So that's first. Um Again, don't want to offend anyone. But she fought Victoria Leonardo. She smashed this lash. She looked great. Step up kicks, rear leg kicks, good jab. Landed a great, uh, was it one, two? It was a right straight for the finish. It came out of nowhere. She just looked like a really experienced kickboxer, which I believe she is, because she got a win over Valentina in the kickboxing ring back in 2015. So she's been at this for a long time, and she looked it. But on the other hand, like this was a complete layup. Leonardo is not good. And like three of her last four losses have been stoppages. One was an injury, to be fair, but like she's got five knockout losses on her record. She's, she gets battered a lot. I mean, Erin Blanchfield knocked her out. Erin Blanchfield is not a, a knockout artiste. She got knocked out by Natalia Silva in her last one. And Natalia Silva is tiny. But yeah, Wang Kong looked great. Um, people were like, why didn't she get the bonus? And I am kind of like, well, it was the best knockout on the card. But equally... She was a minus, she was more than minus 1,000 favorite. She was minus 1,300 favorite, which someone pointed out to me earlier this week when they were like, these cards are just full of minus 1,000 favorites now. And people without a picture that they haven't even bothered to get a picture for, which was crazy on this one because this was a stealthy, no one even knew it was happening. This was a a tough final, tough finale. They used to make a big deal out of these, but two, two of the tough finale fights were on this. And I don't think they had pictures for all of those fighters, which is crazy. In those tough finals, uh, Ryan Loder and Robert Valentin. Robert Valentin, man, he looks the part. He's got runes all over him in in tattoos. And uh, whenever I see that, I go, oh, great. I'm going to learn about a new paramilitary group this week. But uh, nothing come out just yet. (laughs) But uh, he looked the part and then he came out and he literally did what CM Punk did in that famous clip of his UFC fight against Mickey Gall, where he runs across the ring extends both hands ready to punch and then the guy's ducking in on his hips and he's looking down at him like oh no uh, and that's what happened to uh, Robert Valentin uh, he did he actually did all right from his back fighting up from against a, a good wrestler um almost got submitted by an, an Americana from the scarf hole which is a very embarrassing women's MMA submission to get caught in but he rolled over his his own head to to get out of it probably hurt himself in, in the course of that but got on the back and started threatening loader but second round got trapped on the bottom and just got pounded out in a, in a mounted crucifix, which is normally, yeah, that's that's the scourge of like low level MMA. But then Valentina Shevchenko's done it at the highest levels, and so did Habib. 
Nobody really got stuck under Habib though. They just they went all out and they got out of it. But you know, and they spent a lot of energy doing it, but they didn't get stopped underneath. Um, I'm thinking of like Kimbo getting stopped by Roy Nelson, and almost getting stopped by James Thompson. He kept giving the thumbs up, and it was in was it Elite XC? It was one of those mega corrupt fight organizations. And I think that was Dan Mergliata as well. Was like, yeah, the thumbs up is a legitimate defense. The other one of these, I actually liked um, Myron Santos. He, he gave a great account of himself against Khan Offley. Um, yeah, defended lots of takedowns and then hit him with a beautiful, was it an overhand right? But he slumped him and then hit him like two more times while he was on his knees, um, which was, yeah, it was bad. It was one of the most uh, graphic knockouts that you've seen recently. A couple of things that were slightly more interesting happening on this card. Michael Morales fought Neil Magny. Uh, I, I referred to Michael Morales versus Neil Magny as another underwhelming welterweight prospect versus Neil Magny. Um, but he did the, the job that the prospect is supposed to do against Neil Magny. He came out and he low kicked him and said, I've seen some of your fights. And Neil Magny went, oh, no. Well, I guess I'll lose this one and try again next time. <laughs> Neil Magny's never going to learn to check a kick. And Mor Morales landed like three or four good ones, and he was already hobbling Magni. But Magni got in on his leg, pushed him to the fence. Morales turned his back, gave the back lordy lock to try and fight the hands, which is extremely common in MMA now. Um, if you watch Neil Magni versus Anthony Rocket Martin, um, they both took turns doing that. Because if you turn your back, you give up the back body lock, but you can separate the hands and circle out, which will often, if you are capable of separating the hands, save you a lot of time. If you watched Umar versus Corey Sanhagen, one of my big things that I took away from that was, man, Corey Sanhagen, despite no wrestling background at all, might be the best in bantamweight even at separating the hands. He just, he turns his back, looks down, works out how the hands are configured, and then just goes, right, peel, and then he's out. But uh, Bisping seemed absolutely perplexed by this. He was like, why would you ever turn your back? That's a mistake. And uh, then Morales did separate the hands, spun back into him with an elbow, which was very similar to what um, Jose Aldo did to Chad Mendes back in the day. He separated the hands and then he turned back, still holding one hand, and threw a knee, knowing that, uh, or guessing that Mendes would drop for a shot. And uh, he caught him with a beautiful knee. That was their first fight. The second one was much more competitive, best Chad Mendes I'd ever seen, or anyone ever saw, actually. But their first fight was a very quick knockout, or like end of the first round, I think it was by that knee and it was spectacular and that's the one where Aldo ran into the crowd in Brazil and all that but uh, one of the most beautiful knockouts in MMA history I reckon but it was very similar to that he separated the hands and they turned back into him with an elbow uh, hit him in the jaw set him to the floor got on top and then he just sort of mobbed on him for the finish he stood did a throw by pass with a big punch uh, hit Magni and Magni sort of curled up and let him mount him and then got the ground and pound stoppage it was kind of sad late career Magni sort of fight, but Morales is 25. Um, I think I went off him a bit when I realized that his tattoo is not a Jack Slack logo, the tattoo on his chest. The man with the Jack Slack logo on his chest is David Martinez, the smiling assassin, Aussie MMA legend. Um, but no, Morales, I think I was disappointed in his last one against um, Jake Matthews uh, and a little against Max Griffin too. It's, those were two guys who he was sort of being set up against older names to look impressive. And he did a lot of, like, jab work. But he didn't come out and blow those dudes away, which is what you wanted for a guy of the physical gifts that Morales is or has. I just can't get... Like, every time I see Neil Magny now, I'm just... I'm angry about the fact that he's so bad at dealing with kicks. Because he came out, and if you noticed, he was doing that little shimmy where he turns his heel in and his knee out, and he turns back to normal, and he turns it back to neutral, and then again, and then again. And he did it three times, and then he stopped, and then Morales just kicked him in the leg. <laughs> Like, he was getting ready to defend it. And really, like, if you're standing in a way where you can't defend low kicks comfortably straight out of your stance, that's already the issue. Just relearn your stance. If it's cost you this many fights. I mean, some of those fights that he's lost are not to do with this. It's still baffling how there are guys who show up and don't try and kick Neil Magny in the leg. Ever since Lawrence Larkin did it with, like, no resistance, there were dudes who just didn't watch those fights and didn't do it. It was crazy because you're seeing the guys who are not famous for low kicking. They're not great low kickers. They're not even great kickers, full stop. They come out and they batter Neil Magny with low kicks because he can't deal with them. And part of it is because he wants to extend into that jab and he turns his foot in and he wants to really get the range on it. And that just leads to him getting battered even more. What else have we got? Zach Reese versus Jose Medina. This was another one 
What were the odds on this? Yeah, minus 800 favourites, Zacharies. Because from the moment this started, you were like, what the fuck is Jose Medina doing here? Um, he looks a little bit like one of the Urbina brothers. And uh, he certainly fought like the Urbina brothers. The Urbina brothers, I think there's three of them, but two of them have fought in the UFC. They have a combined seven fights and one win. <laughs> they're, just, they're there to be battered. And Jose Medina was just a heavy bag in this fight. There's not even anything interesting to tell you because he just got murdered. Zach Reese's, uh left body kick was great. And in fact, the very first exchange of the fight, he comes out, he throws a left kick on the arm. And then he throws a left kick slightly lower immediately afterwards and, and wins Medina. And I really like that. Just, you know, put it on the arm so they really feel comfortable that they're blocking it. And then slot it in underneath. Borchev versus Lontop was fun. This was so funny for me because when this fight was announced, I knew that Lontop was a, a bit of a banger on the feet, but I, I tweeted uh, the quest to find Borchev, an opponent who hasn't heard about his grappling, continues. <laughs> and then wouldn't you know it, zero takedowns attempted by Lontop. This is a guy who, if you, if you touch his legs, he falls over and then he can't get up like a turtle on his back. Uh, and Lontop was losing the striking pretty convincingly. Um, at, at, certainly at certain points in the fight, he was getting beaten up. He actually picked it up in the third round, I thought. But his corner never said, like, just show a takedown, try a takedown. Reach lamely for his leg just to make him think about the takedown. But nope, never did. And Lontop... He was getting really badly countered because he was leading with his right hand and just running through. And it was like he fought like a dude who has been to MMA gyms and people have gone, damn, bro, you hit hard. Because he wasn't doing anything clever to get himself in. And Borshev was just sliding back and throwing open side counters, open side counter uppercut, battering him. And then finally in the third round, he's jabbing. He's getting a bit closer. Uh, he's letting Borshev go backwards onto kicks and things. If you've got someone who is beating you because they have the perfect distancing. Think of Valentina Shevchenko, actually. You know, she gets right on the end of people's range. She stands so that just her lead leg is kickable. And then everyone she fights goes, right, I'm going to kick that lead leg then. And she just slides it back and then comes back with a counter. If someone is controlling the distance really well, you need to crowd them. You need to get up in their face. You need to risk getting jabbed so that when you attack them and they slide back, you still have things that you can hit them with when they're leaving range. When I was writing that Bilal versus Leon 1 review just before their second fight i said one of the things that really surprised me when Bilal gets up in his face his jab works really well but he needs to get closer and he did that in the rematch and that basically changed the fight but the other one was that he got really close to leon and then he waited for leon to move back and he threw a, a, a body kick as leon was backing up and leon just backed himself onto the end of it it was beautiful and uh, lontop managed to do that a couple of times in this fight land some good kicks as borchev was backing away from him but uh yeah not a bad fight just two very flawed fighters but then, you know, not everyone needs to be a world champion. Everyone, not everyone needs to even come close to being a world champion. And then Gerald Mearshart got a, a submission victory over Edmund Shabazian. Um, Yeah, looked like the usual Gerald Mearshart. Kind of slow. Avoids punches, but you don't know if he's actually seen them. <laughs> it's very weird. Because you'll watch punches whiz just past his face, and he doesn't react. And you go, either he's the coolest customer, and he just moves very slowly, but he can see all this happening or he's not really seeing these punches in the moment that he gets caught, he's going to get knocked unconscious. But yeah, got on top of Shabazian and finished him, and that was very impressive. I like Mirshat a lot. Uh, I kind of like Shabazian, actually. I, I enjoyed what he was doing, backing uh, Mirshat onto the fence. He used the odd double jab. He always had a great body kick. He's just had a real drop-off in recent years. But then he did, he's, he's won a couple in his last, yeah, in his last four he's won two. So that's not bad, because he was on a three-fight slump for quite a while, and he was getting injured all the time and not fighting. Anyway, I reckon that'll do us for today. If you haven't read the Craig Jones Invitational Pitcraft article, definitely go do that. If you want to get in on the extra articles and podcasts, sign up to the Patreon, support the podcast, be a boy. And if you want to send an email to the podcast or a long-form question, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. I'm your boy, Jack Slack. Adelaide Bird committing judging crimes on cards that don't even matter. Bless.